you want to talk about? Yes, sir. We'll go here and then back. This is kind of a difficult thing to say, but I believe a lot of the big money supporters of Jeb Bush would rather have Hillary Clinton president than you and a number of the candidates. I feel really bad about things right now. The most powerful interests in the Republican Party, the two most important issues of there are open borders and the secret trade deal. And now a person who can't even outdate Joe Biden, they're going to make Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who is one of the most open border members of the House and guided through through deceit the secret trade bill. How can I feel anything but despair about who really controls the Republican Party? Well, look, I'd say two things. One, I think that, we're, and one of the things I'm trying to describe to anybody, I often get asked, one of the questions I get asked a lot from reporters and pundits and folks in D.C. is, what's it like out there? I mean, it's almost like we're living in a different country. It's almost like, you know, you don't need a passport to come visit America. You're allowed to come and, and seek for yourself. And one of the things I tell them over and over is, look, you need to come listen to everyday Americans who are, are frustrated and mad, and they're mad in D.C. You look at the influence that the special interests, when you think about it, how do you get, how does a Republican Party support something like No Child Left Behind that ultimately leads to Common Core? How does a Republican Party say we're for open borders and, and, and amnesty? How does a Republican Party say that we're going to give this president through TPA more trade authority than even the Democrats didn't all want to give him? Except a Republican, but now think about this. I said this president was awful in negotiating for America. Look at the Iran deal. I say he's been awful in not following the Constitution and the laws. And it was Republicans that bent over backwards to give him this extra trade authority. And you're right, for a deal that we weren't allowed to see. It was such a great deal, we weren't allowed to read it and look at it for ourselves, and they gave us extra trade promotion for it. And so I think we're right to be angry. Look, I'm not here to tell you you shouldn't be angry. You should be angry. But here's the good news, whether they understand this or not, they work for us. And that's why I think it's time to fire them. And that's why I think it's time to say, look, we're not looking for long, complicated explanations. It's real simple to me. If anybody comes that's running for office and tells you yes or no that they can't vote for term limits or a balanced budget amendment, or any of these big things we need to change, just tell them, we're done with it. I don't care what other speech you give me, I don't care how nice you are, I don't care what pretty commercials you're running, we're not voting for you. It's that simple. The one thing that motivates them more than anything is their fear of losing their offices. I'm convinced that's because this is the best job almost all of them can get. <laughs> I mean, think about it, most of them you wouldn't hire in your private workplace. They're not going to ever get these perks or benefits anywhere else. And I think it's time for us to take control back. You know, the Republican Party doesn't belong to them, it belongs to us. Sure. And that's why I am a lifelong Republican, I'm also a lifelong conservative. I hope that you'll stay, and look, it'd be easy for me to give you a bunch of platitudes about why everything's fine. I want you to stay angry. Because if you don't stay angry, we're not going to get our party back. If we just go and say, I want, I want the Republicans to win the White House, I don't want to let just any Republican. If we elect a Republican that just makes incremental changes and goes along to get along, we're done. I don't think we got four years. I really don't. I think four years from now, we may not even recognize. We won't recognize this country. We'll have a generation of Americans who will only understand America from either what they read in the history books. I said that once before, and somebody said, what makes you think they're going to describe it in the history books? The way they're trying to rewrite our history. I said, well, they'll hear it from us. But they want to experience it themselves. At least we can remember what we're fighting to get back. But I fear four more years of these policies, either under Hillary Clinton or Republicans don't want to make changes, we'll be talking to ourselves, and there'll be a whole generation will think this is just the way it has to be. This is the way it's all of it. If you want to see that future, look to Europe. And again, I mean, look, it'll be a, a gradual decline, but America's always been a young country, not just because of when we were founded, but our attitude's always been the best is yet to come. The genius of America, this is such an important point, the genius of America was our founding fathers understood they were creating a limited government. The genius of America was our government. The genius of America was they were creating a limited government to secure but not create our God-given rights. There are a lot of governments, there are a lot of constitutions that guarantee you civil rights, but they come from the government. If the government gives you your rights, the government can take away your rights. Sorry. Our founding fathers understood that our creator gave us our rights. And we got to reassert that. Just graduated from college, probably from the SEC East Tigers. Um, <laughs> all that other team. Congratulations. <laughs> That's three Tigers in the SEC, of course. Um, but I have a lot of friends who have 
student debt, and they are beginning to pay it back this year. I think it's six, like you get six months or something before you have to start paying. Um, by the grace of God, I don't. But um, you, LSU is in Baton Rouge. You are next to it. And I went to college. What are you going to do so that my generation doesn't have so much student debt? Because there's over one trillion dollars that people my age and even some people here are still be paying off. No, that's a great question. So that trillion dollars of student debt is not only bad for students that have to pay it off, but it's also bad for our economy. Because those are students that are deferring, starting families, getting married, buying homes, buying cars. It ripples throughout the entire economy. So you're exactly right. Four things I think we have to do. And one thing we should not do that the left is talking. Four things we should do. Number one, we have to grow the, the real world economy. One of the reasons student debt is so crippling is tuition keeps growing so much faster than incomes. Young people are more likely to be underemployed, unemployed in this economy. 2% growth is not real growth. We can grow faster than 4%. We've got stagnant middle class incomes. We've got record number of Americans dropping out of the workforce, giving up looking for jobs. And there are a lot of things we can do to grow the economy. Shrink the government, have a rational energy plan that's an all of the above strategy, bring back those manufacturing jobs, repeal Obamacare, rein in the EPA so we're not regulating the economy to death. I think regulation should have to be voted on up or down by Congress so that you don't have these unelected bureaucrats straying on our economy. I think it should require an independent cost-benefit analysis so they can't just impose these burdens of regulation by anybody looking at them. But in other words, first, lower flatter tax codes so we don't have the highest tax rates in the developed world. Grow the economy so graduates' incomes are actually rising. And, and, and that way you don't have tuition growing so much faster than the income level. Second, when you repeal the government monopoly on student loans and student debt. They snuck this in as part of Obamacare. Many students that do have debt ask me, well, why am I paying this high interest rate? None of us can afford it. We don't get that interest rate. You go try to put money in a bank, nobody's paying you 6%. Nobody's paying you these high interest rates. Well, part of the reason is that you don't have competition for that debt. So you don't have banks and credit unions competing to offer lower interest rates to allow students to refinance. Third, we need to break up the accreditation monopoly. To really lower the, the student debt issue, you also have to lower the cost of getting an education. With today's technology and today's world, why can't we make it easier for students to earn credits for service and life experiences, for military service? Why is it easier to transfer credits between institutions, across state lines, public and private? It's far too complicated in part because of the accreditation model. And by the way, when I suggested this reform to the president when we met with him as a group of governors, his response was instructive. The arrogance was amazing. He said, we couldn't do that. I said, well, if you don't, you know, if you're worried about quality control, let the states be involved. And so we couldn't do that because then students would get ripped off. He didn't trust the states. He forgot what Reagan reminded us in his first inaugural. The federal government didn't create the states. The states created the federal government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing that we got to do, and this is what, you know, finally, then I'm going to contrast that with what we shouldn't do. You mentioned LSU. In Louisiana, we have a program called TOPS. And we've, taught, we've done several things that make, as a result, we have one of the lowest tuition rates in the country. We're one of the 10 best states in terms of the portion of our students with debt and how much debt they graduate with. We've done several things. One, our colleges, our public universities, community and technical colleges, are not allowed to raise their tuition without a two-thirds vote of the legislature. So at least there's open side. So they can't just, you know, all their own side of what they want. Well, let me finish what we did in Louisiana and what we're not supposed to do in D.C. We also did something called the TOPS program. And what we did with TOPS, we said if you maintain, if you're in high school, you get a 20 on the ACT, and you have a 2.5 GPA, we will pay for your tuition. And if you do better than that, we'll pay for room and board and books and other expenses as well on a sliding scale. It's one of the reasons we have such low amounts of debt. And we do other things as well. As a result, again, you know, we're one of the lowest in tuitions, lowest in debt, lowest in the number of kids with debt. Here's what I don't want. I don't want DC, I don't want the federal government paying, I mean, you've got Hillary Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders racing to say that the federal government should pay for tuition. Well, why stop there? Why not have the federal government buy you a house and a car while we're at? I mean, why are they being so cheap? <laughs> <laughs> you may be in the wrong place. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, look, at, at some point, at some point, we have to be honest and say, People like to say, well, they just print money, they borrow money from China. No, they're not. They're spending our children's money. In essence, by overspending, we're stealing from our children. What parent would want to do that? What parent would say, I'm going to break up with my child's piggy bank and steal their money? That's what we're basically doing when we overspend. 
And so in terms of what DC can do, no, I think some of those programs are best left at the state level and then let the states compete. I, I would encourage other states, and other states have adopted top site programs. And they have different names, they have different definitions. Georgia's got a whole program. Different states have, have adopted similar or different, you know, slightly different programs. Some are not as expansive, but ours is one of the most expansive in the entire country. It, it's, not, it's not based on financial need. We have another separate financial need based program called Go Brands. But TOPS is purely any and every student who meets those criteria, we pay their tuition. And if they want to go to a private school, they can take that money and apply it towards the private school student, <coughs> as long as it's in the state. But now that, that competition needs to happen in the state level. I think mean, the states are supposed to be laboratories of experimentation. I don't want the, their powers. Look, it's so tempting to say, well, when I'm president, I'm going to give the federal government these powers. The problem is that if you're OK with the federal government having those powers, you can't then complain when the left, when the Democrats get elected, they want to use that power for something else you don't like. You know, we can't just be limited government conservatives only when they're in power. And that was a mistake behind No Child Left Behind. That was a Republican bill that opened the door for Common Core. So I think there are several things we can do to reduce student debt and, and make it more manageable. But the answer is not to have the federal government just start giving away money we don't have. Yes, sir. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the United Nations uh, funding? I'm not. If you want to tell me about it. <laughs> but it, it has a lot to do with restructuring and the government. <coughs> Well, I'm, I'd be certainly happy to look at The question was, for those who may not have heard of it, he asked about United Nations Project 21. And I, I told him I wasn't familiar with it. He said it had a lot to do with eminent domain and, and restructuring. I will say this, you know, and I'm, I'm more than happy to look into it and even talk after if you want to share some more details with me. I will tell you this. I think the president, when he takes his oath, it's a very specific oath, he swears to uphold the United States Constitution and laws, not international sovereignty. I'm not for any president, I'm not for this government giving up our sovereignty to any international body. Whether it's the UN, whether it's the international courts, or whether it's, I mean, any of those lies, I think that's a mistake. I don't like when the Supreme Court's trying to rely on international precedent. That's not their job. Their job is to apply the United States Constitution. When it comes to eminent domain in Louisiana, we actually amended our own state constitution to make it very clear that the government the, can't come in and use eminent domain to take somebody's property to benefit a private, another private property, or in terms of economic development or anything like that. Look, I mean, private property rights are pretty important. The reality is if the government's got the right to take away our property, what's next? And I think we've got to be very, very careful about that. And that's why they, they amended our state constitution even before I was there. And I'm glad they did that. So but I'm more than happy to talk about that. But in general, I'm not for I'm not for giving up our sovereignty, and I'm certainly not for this casual use of them in the name. I don't think it should be used. You know, if, if somebody else in the private sector wants to buy your property, they should come negotiate with you and, and, until you're a willing seller. If you're not a willing seller, they should go find someone else for you. But they shouldn't use government to try to take away the property. I don't think that's right. Yes, sir. Yeah, you. Oh, <laughs> two questions. Sure. The environment. Uh, one, uh, particularly for Texas, the environment. Um, we have a lot of situation here, and I have to have 49 in the nation. And I'm concerned about the need for environmental protections, whether it be the EPA or the states or whatever. Isn't the environment by another name of God's creation? Yes. Second question, and it has to do with climate change. I'd like to read a sentence from a prominent Iowa Republican. Tell me if you agree or disagree. I acknowledge that a changing climate is a historical and scientific fact. And I recognize that most scientists say man-made emissions contribute to climate change. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll tell you what I believe on climate. I didn't hear anything that sounded objectionable. I don't know what the context was or what he said before or after that. Mm -hmm. But but I would say this. This is what I believe about uh, climate change. I'm more than happy to lead to the scientists. I, do, do human beings have an impact on our environment? Of course we do. I'm sure we do. How much and the impacts of that, I'm happy to lead to the scientists. I don't think you should look to a politician or elected figure. I think the policy question is, what are the policies we enact in, in response to that? What do we do about that? I'd say a couple of one, I think we can protect our environment. I do view it as God's creation. And I think as Christians, we're called to be stewards of God's creation. And not only as a Christian, I'd say as a, just also as a, as a father, look, I, I got young boys. We love the outdoors. We call Louisiana Sportsman's Paradise. My little boys, they love to go duck hunting. They love to go. I got one child that loves to go fishing. I want there to be clean air and water and, and ground for them and one day their children after them. 
That's his thought. I mean, that's look as a parent, that's part of my responsibility. Leave the world a little better than we found it, at least. I'd say two things. One, I think you can have a clean environment, a strong economy, and affordable energy. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And I think too often the left tries to say, well, no, that you're going to have to make energy expensive or you can't grow the economy. I think that's wrong. I think the reality is with American innovation, with an all the above energy approach, we can have those things. And secondly, I think we need to be very wary of so called solutions that hurt our economy to the detriment compared to other countries and don't really do anything for the environment. So, for example, the president negotiated this deal with China. And the problem is, is that we take all these actions up front, they don't do anything until the out years, like 2030, it's not even buying them. I'll give you a real world, world example of what I'm talking about. So, we had a big steel facility called Nucor that wanted to invest in my state, back in my first job. Would have been over $3 billion investment, over 1,000 permanent jobs, over $70,000 a year salary, plus benefits. This is a huge, I mean, this is a great investment. These are $70,000 a year, $75,000 a year, you can feed a family, you can raise a family, that's a good job. Now, Louisiana's a relatively low cost of life, you know, low cost of living, we'll, we'll take that. Well, they were about to proceed, there was an election, because they were worried about the EPA in part, they then slowed down for a couple of years and said, we might go to Brazil instead. Now, what I worry about that is if, if we end up passing restrictions that disadvantage us vis-a-vis -vis the other countries we compete with and trade with, who, how does that help the environment or the economy? I would argue that our laws are much stricter than what they're going to find overseas. So if we just export all these energy-intensive jobs, we can pat ourselves on the back and think, pretend like we've done something. We've done nothing for the environment, we've hurt our economy. So I worry about these one-sided agreements. Whatever we do, we need to do in concert with the countries we compete with and we trade with, especially China, and especially these other countries. Because I want to see those good manufacturing jobs in America. I want those jobs that pay like that here. Now, the good news is Newport did decide to build in Louisiana in America. They built the first phase, and they're looking for the subsequent phases. So, yes, it's, it's God's creation, and yes, we need to be good some responsible stewards of it. Part of being responsible is also making sure these jobs aren't going to countries that have looser environmental laws than we do. And, and I think we can do that. Yes, ma'am. welfare program, and she cited a very specific example of a woman pretending like a child lived there just to, whenever she knew the authorities would come and check. And the question was, how do we help people get back in the workforce? How do we change that? A couple of things. One that we can do by law, but another thing that, just to be honest, we've got to change our culture. It's not all legal. Because changing the law is actually easier of the two. But you got to do both. Here's the law change. In the 90s, Congress did welfare reform. And at the time, it was very controversial. Clinton vetoed it, vetoed it, and he signed it. And it really had two components to it. One, it said that welfare should be temporary. And secondly, if you got welfare, there had to be a work requirement. You either had to be working or getting an education, looking for a job. There had to be a responsibility. Now, the left, at the time, just criticized. They said, this would be awful. People will be dying in the streets. This is cruel. This we can't do this. When it was finally signed into law, remember, Republican Congress passed it, and eventually a Democratic president signed it. Saw the largest drop in teenage pregnancy rates and poverty rates we've ever seen in this country. But two problems with that. One, under President Obama, he has steadily, through administrative actions, eroded the work requirements. And secondly, Congress didn't apply that to all welfare programs. They only did some. Like, they didn't apply it to Medicaid or other programs. So the legal fix is we need to go back in there put the work requirements back, and expand it, apply it to, to other types of welfare programs. Now, I think, you know, look, I don't think anybody begrudges. There are people that truly need help, and they should get that help. That's what a compassionate, that, that, that is the right thing. I don't think anybody begrudges that. But I think that the frustration is, to your point, we need to be incentivizing and helping people get back to the workforce. So for those that can work, this should become a permanent lifestyle. This should become a multi-generational culture. Here's the cultural change we've got to change. And this is a lot harder. 
you know, there was a time when there was a stigma to getting assistance, to getting welfare, as opposed to an entitlement mentality that says, get everything we can. I'll tell you two stories, one out of the movie, one out of my, my parents' life. So the movie, I don't know how many of you have seen Cinderella Man. It was a boxing movie from several years ago. And this wasn't essential to the story, but it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And I hope I don't spoil the movie for anybody, but in short, it's about a famous boxer, it was based on true life events, who was a famous, famous, successful boxer, fell on hard times during the Depression, lost everything, and held out as long as he could. He had his pride, but when he was at the verge of losing his children, Broke down and went down low. And then the rest of the movie is all about his climb back up. You know, it's a, it's a nice feel good movie about how he climbs way back to the top. But here was a scene, this was a very small scene, it had nothing to do with the main plot of the movie that I loved. So he goes to get the welfare because he's so desperate to save his kids, and the woman behind the counter is so disappointed. She said, I never thought I'd see you here. Like, I mean, he just couldn't believe that he was there. And he was embarrassed, but he had to save his children. He didn't want to give up his children. But as he's coming back, as his career is coming back, one day he goes back to the welfare office and he stands in line to give the money back. It wasn't a big scene in the movie if you blink you'll miss it. But I love that. I love just what it says about he wanted to pay it back as soon as he could. Now here's the real life example. Remember I told you that story about when I was born, <laughs> I joked my parents paid for me away away. There was another hospital down the road called Earl K. Long. It was a charity hospital. Louisiana's unique. We operated a statewide network of charity hospitals where anybody could go for free. And my parents could have just as easily gone there to the charity hospital. And when I asked my dad later, well, why didn't you go there? It would have been free. Nobody would have known. You wouldn't have had to pay every month. I love his answer. He'd only been in this country for a few months. He goes, that wasn't for us. That was for people who really needed it. He wasn't criticizing them for it. Now think about it. He'd only been in this country for a few months. Didn't own hardly anything. Did, they didn't buy their first home until I was seven years old. Because they didn't have enough money for the down payment. They saved and saved and saved. Didn't have insurance to cover me. It would have been so much easier instead of incurring this big debt right when it didn't start it to have gone to that free hospital. But just knew in his bones that's not what we are here to do. That's the culture we've got to get back. And my parents weren't unusual. That was the most, my parents weren't unusual in paying that doctor. That's just what the reason they didn't need a contract was the doctor knew he was going to pay them. That's just what everyday dads and moms did. There was nothing extraordinary about it. That was just the norm. One of the things we fought for was school choice in Louisiana, where the dollars follow the child. And one story, one final, and I promise I'll never answer every question this long. But one thing we did was we said there are kids that are trapped in failing school because of where they grow up. That's, a, that's not right. I want to tell you real quickly, there was a family in New Orleans East. I went to a parochial school there to visit because a lot of the kids went there on scholarship programs. And there was a mom there who told me her story. New Orleans East is north of the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Got hit hard by Katrina. And so this school had been flooded by Katrina. They rebuilt it. It got burnt down again. They rebuilt it. And there were a lot of parents that were using the scholarship programs we had started to bring their kids there. They couldn't afford to go to that school otherwise. I met one mom there, a single mom, and she told me her story. She said her mother had gotten pregnant as a teenager with her and went on welfare. She got pregnant as a teenager, went on welfare, and was now here with her daughter, who she had, and was at the school in this program. She told me that she was working three jobs so that her daughter could go to the school. She said she wasn't Catholic, but she knew she wanted her daughter to go to this school. She liked the Christian values, and she liked the, the school. She had tears in her eyes as she was telling me the story. She said the reason she knew this school was better for her daughter, it was the first time her daughter had ever brought home homework in all her years of going to school. First time her daughter had worn a uniform and felt safe. First time she was thinking about going to school after this school, like staying in school. This mom was basically saying to me, I don't want my child to make the same mistakes that I made when my mom made before. I want a better future for her. That's the American dream. That's what my parents wanted to Think we should ever give up hope and say, oh, we can never break the cycles. We can. And we've got to fight hard to do it because this is the essential battle in this election. And look, lowering tax rates, cutting regulations, that's relatively easy. Culture's hard. That's why I think this president's most dangerous <coughs> initiative has been to try to redefine the idea of America. If he teaches a generation to be jealous of other people that have been successful, if he teaches a generation that government dependence is your goal, if he teaches us, it's all about redistribution, not growth, not freedom. 
then we lose what's special about this country. So I think you're right, we gotta pass laws, we gotta fight for our culture as well. Yes. Yeah, um, I see you're trying to go through a record of slashes and budgets. I do know what skills or plans you have to uh, take up to the Pentagon. There's a lot of pain capitalism going on, there's a lot of our money there. Sure, well, a couple of things. The question was, you know, look, I've cut spending. How about taking those skills to the Pentagon? And then what are our plans for reform there? A couple of things. And we got a detailed defense paper you can see online. You're right. I do think we need to procure the reforms. I think we need to cut the number of civilian contractors. I think we need a multi-source key parts. We need to require the technology be completed from design to execution in seven years. Too often now, we, we go and design and buy new technology. It's outdated by the time we deploy it. I think that we have to take power back from Congress. They're not going to like this. Because they like to protect suppliers in their districts. They like to protect contractors that employ people back home as opposed to what's good for the men and women in uniform. There are several reforms we've got to make, and there are others we detail. I also think, however, that the military is one of the few areas, I think we need to cut government spending. We do need to reform it. But I also think we need to be spending more on our military. I worry we're hollowing out our military. We have fewer soldiers, older and fewer planes and ships. But I agree, just throwing money at the Pentagon without reforms is not enough. And they're not ready for all that new money overnight. It'll take a few years to get back to 4% of GDP where we need. But you're exactly right. You know, even in areas where we need to invest, we need to make sure there isn't that kind of waste and there isn't that kind of duplication, that kind of corruption. Look, I think crony capitalism is legalized corruption. It's basically what it is. And both parties, and that's how our tax code got so complicated. Both sides put in breaks for their friends. I don't like it when Democrats do it, but I don't like it when Republicans do it either. It doesn't make it any better just because the Republicans are with us. Both parties need to give up. Yes, what do you think of the third tax? Well, one of the things I looked at, was, and we came up with our own tax proposal. One of the things with the, the fair tax, one of my concerns, and you know, because I like the, I, I get the motivation behind it. we should be looking at tax and consumption and, and encouraging. And one thing my tax code does is it creates a tax-free savings vehicle to stop discriminating against people that save versus consumption. One of my concerns is I don't want to give the federal government another taxing power unless, I mean, only the only way I can see ever giving them another taxing power is to repeal the, or, or enact a new constitutional amendment so they can't tax income. What I worry about is if you let them tax sales, national sales tax, they'll simply add that to the income tax. They don't want to give away what they've got, they'll just add that to what we've already got and get a higher tax. I lived in England for a couple of years. They had this bad, I forget, it was like the high team, 17, 18 percent. It was hidden. So when you went and bought a good, you didn't know it wasn't broken. Like when we go buy things, the sell tax is broken out. There it's baked in. You don't know how much of it is taxed. So one of my concerns is I don't want the government having another taxing power. So it would have to be done at least, and there may be other issues, but the, one of the important issues is I want to see them get rid of their income tax. If we're going to give them any other tax in they need to give that one up. But that's one of the reasons we came up with our tax plan. But I like that. I understand people that are for that. I get it. You know, why they're trying to encourage folks to invest and save. Yeah, I mean, everybody pays taxes, right. not just the people that are working for you. Well, and that's why we, I agree with that premise. And that's why we've got that 2% rate. I do think everybody should pay. I agree with that. Yes, ma'am, go back. Okay, you've talked a lot about securing the border and whatnot. But what about the $11 million undocumented immigrants that are already here? What's going to happen? Sure, well, two things. One, I think that we will be a pragmatic and compassionate country, but the reality is I don't think we can start talking about that until after we secure the border. We tried this in the 80s, and it was a comprehensive approach. They gave amnesty. They said, give amnesty, we'll secure the border. They gave amnesty, we didn't secure the border. Now we've got 11 million or more here illegally. My concern is if we start talking about that now, we'll never get the border secure. So secure the border, then we can have that conversation. I know the left doesn't like that answer, and I know they, they want to say, no, 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 we've got to do what we did in the 80s. That's how you get the gang of eight come from. And I think that was a mistake. Yes, How did you institute your limits since Congress will never? The only way we can do it is with your help. We came within one vote of getting the balanced budget amendment, at least ratified by Congress, then sent to the states back in the 90s. Two thirds of the House voted for it, one vote shy in the Senate. This is the only way it happens. Because you're right, they're not going to want to give up that power. As president, I can say, look, I'm going to make you vote on this. We won't do anything else we vote on because I think it is that important. It has to be an up or down vote. And then it's going to take voters showing up in town halls like this, flooding the email boxes, flooding their, their, their switchboards, their, their phone, uh, their operators, and saying, look, tell me yes or no, are you voting for this or not? And just understand that the answer is no, we're not voting for you. Ever again. In Louisiana, they did turn on this, even before I was governor. And Legislators didn't fall in love with it, but there were so many people on both sides of the aisle pushing for it, they couldn't say no. They were afraid of losing their offices. They were afraid that they voted against this. It was such a, the reason 80% of the American people want this, and that's why they don't vote. 
They know if they vote, they ever had a vote on it, they have to vote for it. That's why they play all these games. You know, they have this rules committee that says this is out of order. You can't vote on this, you can't vote on that. So you can't give them anywhere to hide, but I can't do it alone. Reagan proved the power of the people. He had a Democratic majority. He got tax cuts done. He won the Cold War. People love to fantasize and, and romanticize this and say, oh, well, Tip O'Neill used to love drinking with Reagan. They were just nice buddies. That's all well and good. Tip O'Neill didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to let the Republican president get what he wants. He had House Democrats that were scared because they heard members, they heard voters in their district say, hey, tell me why you're not for cutting my tax rates. Tell me why you're not supporting this popular president who wants to take on the evil empire and build up our military. And so it's going to take the power of the people. But we shouldn't underestimate our I know we've gotten so trained by those folks in D.C. thinking that they don't care about what we do, that things can't get better. They work for us. We can fire all of them if we want. And we should use that power. That's the only thing they're going to listen to. But we've got to need it. We can't let them fool us. We can't be like Charlie Brown in the football. If they tell us anything but yes, they're voting for it, they don't get our votes. I don't care how I don't care what else they've done. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care how pretty their brochures are. It's got to be yes or no. Are you going to be for term limits or not? Are you going to be for a balanced budget amendment to the, the Constitution or not? Because even when Republicans are in control, the reason I say the balanced budget amendment as well, even when Republicans are in control, they spend money they don't have. They don't spend as much as the Democrats. They don't grow the deficit as much. They still grow it. And so, you know, think about it this way. The Democrats had the White House, the House, and the Senate for two years. They got Obamacare done. They got trillion dollar stimulus done. They got Dodd Frank done. We had the White House, the House, and the Senate for six years. What did we get done? Now, I'm proud that they kept us safe after 9 11, and I don't think we should ignore that. That was very good. That's, that's very, very good. I'm not saying that's a small thing. But what were the conservative reforms they got done with these kinds of lasting impacts? That tells you something. And that's why we've got to take back control of our own party and take it back control. It's not about the Republican Party, it's about our country. It's about taking back control of our government. Yes, ma'am. I hear that people are saying that the Republican Party doesn't have the Sure. So the question was common for us. She said, see, here's a lot of people don't like it, but she doesn't know what it is and wants to know why people don't like it. I'll show you why I don't like it. And I'll tell you from two, two perspectives. One as a governor and one as a parent. So I don't like it. And what common for it is, and what it was first described as a voluntary set of high-quality standards for our classrooms. So that's pretty not So we can be against that. We all want our kids to learn. We all want our kids. We're tired of seeing America be 16th or 17th in these international rankings. So sounds great. The problem was it became less than voluntary and less than high quality. So what happened was under Arnie Duncan, the Federal Department of Education gave hundreds of millions of dollars to a couple of groups called Smarter Balance and Park to develop these common core tests. And then the Federal Department of Education went to states and said, if you want a no child left behind waiver, over 40 states have these waivers. And if you want some of your own taxpayer dollars back, you have to adopt common core. And right now, Common Core standards are in ELA, what we used to call, you know, kind of reading comprehension, English literature, that kind of thing, and math. Those are the two areas where there are Common Core standards. But here's the problem with that. The federal government is never supposed to be the primary government entity running K-12 education. That's always been a state or local responsibility. Mm -hmm. And once you get, just philosophically, I don't think the federal government should do that, because imagine this. Today, it's ELA and math. And they're not doing this, but suggest that tomorrow, let's say they woke up and, and Arnie Duncan or his successor or Obama said, you know what, we're going to add American history too. Imagine how they would teach American history, how it would be different from how we would teach American history. Anyway, in the old days, if you didn't like a curriculum or curricula decisions, you could go to your local school, principal, school board, legislator, and say, hey, why, why are you? But now if you go, they just tell you, look, we don't have a choice. So my first objection to it is philosophical. The federal government never should have been doing these, never should have been making these decisions, coercing states, coercing schools. My second objection. Now the objection is a father, more practical objection. I want to just take my kids, or now 13, 9, and 11. My youngest boy was in the second grade a couple of years ago, and he brought home his common core math. Now, 
Math, the way that we learned, I'm going to assume, was pretty straight. Now, second grade math is really not, I mean, I've got a 13 year old girl in high school. Sometimes she brings over homework. You've got to read the book before you can help her. It's, you know, it's a little more complicated. Second grade math, I still remember having to do. I mean, second grade math was 18 plus 4 is 22. I mean, it's, it's kind of addition, subtraction. The way we learn math, I bet we all learn the same way. You added numbers in a column, you carried over digits, and it worked just fine. Well, my little boy brings home common kind of formula. And this is how I knew we had a problem because my wife calls out to me and says, you need to come talk to your son. <laughs> that is never a good sign. It is never my son when he's hit a home run or maybe on a roll. I said, all right, but it's late, dude. Well, I looked at his math test. He got every answer right. That was a good news. But then the second half of the test was you had to show why your answers were right using these common four methods. And as an example, every one of those problems became a six-step process. And you had to draw circles and squares and rectangles. Instead of 18 plus 4, it became 20 minus 2 plus 4. And you had to draw all these symbols. And the question was, show why your answers are right. I love my boy. He's got the attention span of a gnat. <laughs> I mean, even more. God bless his teachers for getting him to sit still in class. I don't know how they do it all day long. I mean, and, and somehow they do that with a class filled with boys and girls that age. Well, this is what my little boy had done. Because he just didn't have, he was not going to sit still and write like, that for each and every one of his problems. So for every question where it said, show why your answer is right, this is what he written. Just because it is. <laughs> No idea what to do with this. So she circles it, sends it home. My wife doesn't know what to do with it. She gives it to me. I talk to him for five minutes. I can't tell him what anything he's done is wrong, so I tell him go outside and play. I'm like, I'm glad we had this talk. <laughs> this is really great. Like, well, I can't. And here's my concern. If we frustrate our young children, they're not going to want to continue to take them. They're not going to continue to learn. Now it's second grade, but one day it's going to be more complicated. And these my little boys, I want to brag on them, he's good at that. I mean, he's getting great grades. He was understanding math, and even math experts have said this isn't an intuitive way to teach math. I had a, a little bit of a debate with a woman about this a couple of months ago. We were talking about Common Core. She was interviewing me, and she said, well, you know what? Her child had come home and had this new advanced Common Core math, and she said she couldn't help her child with their homework, and she was proud of that, that, that her child was learning this new. And I said, I think parents should be able to help their kids with their homework. That's why I just disagree. I think that it, we should be able to help them with their PLA and their math. And it should be more intuitive. I'm all for our kids learning the best according to high standards. But fundamentally, if I've got a problem, I want to be able to go and talk to my, my kid's teacher. When I went to talk to his teacher, she agreed with us but said, what can I do about it? My hands are tied. And these are the common core standards we have to use because that's how they're going to be tested and that's how they're going to be evaluated. And so that's what common core is. That's why I, I'm actually in federal court right now against the Obama administration. It's like they have violated the Constitution by forcing common core on the school. I'm going to close with this. Remember up front, I said, I'm going to stay here, and I am going to stay here as long as folks want to come visit. So I look forward to doing that. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, if you just want to come and tell me something or, or whatever you want to do, I'll stay here as long as folks want. Let me close where I started. The idea of America is slipping away. It's not too late. We can get our country back, but we need your help to do it. Sign up with us today. Join our cause. Believe again in this great country. God bless y'all. Thank you.